Hi everyone, welcome and welcome back to Dr. Hans Classroom. So this week, let's talk about vaccine again. Mm, wait,、um, now I know we've been talking about vaccine for a few weeks now, and I'm sure a lot of you and me are getting tired of this topic. So this week, let's switch gear, talk about treatment. Update for COVID, and I know we've been kind of not paying enough attention on this topic, and now the Delta variant is infecting both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So I think this topic would be very relevant for everyone、um, that are watching this video. Now, I want to make this very clear first. This video is not. Intended to make any recommendation on treatment, I am going to present the CDC, FDA recommendations, also a guideline from a peer review article that hold a different opinion, and also some update on drugs that are coming up in clinical trials. So this video is for educational purpose only, so please keep that in mind. And without further ado, let's get started. Let's first look at the current NIH recommendations on COVID treatment. The NIH COVID treatment website just updated their recommendation on August 25th, so it's very recent. The summary page highlights that the viral replication drives early stages of the infections, and later stage is driven by overreacting host immune and inflammatory response to the virus and leading to tissue damage. So during early stage of the disease progressions, we designed drugs. We want drugs to target the virus and to slow down virus replications, leading to decreased viral load. And during later This stage of the treatment strategy, we want drugs that can target the overreacting immune system, leading to decrease in inflammations and decrease in tissue damages. And there are generally three approaches to treatments. First one is being supportive and monitoring, and this first strategy has been discussed in many, many very good videos made by practicing physicians on YouTube, and you can very easily search it out. So that's not the focus of this video. Second one is treatment in hospital, and the third strategy is treatment before hospitalization. So we will focus on. Talking、uh, point two and point three here. So the recommendation here laid it out that once the patient is hospitalized, the major drug that would be used would be remdesivir. Now it is a FDA approved antiviral drug for COVID patient age twelve and up and weight at least. 88 pounds and hospitalized. So when they are not hospitalized, people are not supposed to be on remdesivir.、Um, but right now there are also clinical trials trying to see if there's、uh, any usefulness for non-hospitalized patients. Now again,、uh, once they are getting worse, okay, the condition getting worse,、um, they start. Needing oxygens and respiratory support, then there will be more drug added to it, and this one would be a steroid drug, the dexamethasone. Now it is designed to decrease inflammations. Also, some other drugs can add to this treatment guideline. Now, just for your knowledge, something called monoclonal antibodies or other oral immune suppression drug can add to this treatment algorithm, and the goal is still to decrease. Increase inflammations and prevent tissue damage. Now here are all the in parentheses the names of these monoclonal antibodies.、Uh, they're kind of complicated to say, so I won't say it. But anyway, those are the MAP drugs, so you can call those MAP drug. So what we've just went through are the approach for hospitalized adults, and when a patient is hospitalized,、uh, the fact is that they don't really have much of a choice. They will just have to take whatever the hospital gives them, right?、Um, now I want to spend more time on talking about approach for non-hospitalized adult. This area actually is is most debatable currently, and is that the only the current only NIH. 
panel recommendations for a subset of these non-hospitalized adult is monoclonal antibodies, and we have two of those. One is a combo of two monoclonal antibody, and with a brand name called uh, Regencov or Regencov, um, no matter how you say it. Now, this actually was the um, combination of monoclonal antibody that was given to former President Trump um, during his sickness in. Uh, late September, October of last year. And just very recently, there's another monoclonal body, um, Sotrovimab, that is uh, authorized for treating mild to moderate COVID infections and with a catch with a high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19, uh, meaning hospitalizations or death. So now let's look at these monoclonal antibodies. Now, the Regencov and Sotrovimab are both under FDA emergency use authorizations to treat mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and children aged 12 and above with at least 88 pounds or 40 some kilograms who are at risk for progression to severe COVID-19. And COVID-19 patients who are 65 plus or with certain medical conditions are some of those high risk factors. So basically, what you can think is everyone, every COVID patients who are age 65 should be on the monoclonal antibodies as soon as having a positive COVID test. That is what the current um, emergency use labels. Now, other than using the two monoclonal antibodies for treating mild to moderate cases, the FDA also authorized Regencov for post-exposure prophylaxis of COVID for the same group of people who are not fully vaccinated or who are not expected to mount an adequate immune response even after vaccinations. And Regencov can also be given to people who are at high risk of exposure to an infected individual in nursing homes and prisons. So now that we know that when this regin cove can be used, the question is, are we using enough of this monoclonal antibody for mild and moderate COVID cases treatment? One of the biggest factors is always money. Now, first, Regencov is almost free for all patients in the U.S. The U.S. government is paying for the product. Here is the uh, small box that I captured from the drug website and highlighted it's free for requesting site. However, now depending on the site, some patients may need to pay a small administering fee to the site, which may or may not be covered with insurance. So when something is free, you would think more people would get it, right? But note, according to this news article from Washington Post on August 19 or August 20th, the White House COVID-19 response team reported that just more than 600,000 people had received Regencov and another monoclonal antibody treatment between November and the end of July. And Regeneron Pharmaceuticals said that this amount had only reached fewer than 30% of eligible patients. So seven out out of the 10 patients that are eligible fit the labeling for using this uh, monoclonal antibodies are not getting it. This number is alarmingly low, especially now with the Delta variant. Both mild and moderate cases can happen in vaccinated and unvaccinated people over 65. So I hope this treatment gets picked up by more people in a very newer future. So we know we have a very effective treatment for mild to moderate cases uh, of COVID, particularly in older populations. But on the other hand, very recently, an Alabama doctor and a group of uh, practice in North Texas expressed that they are not willing to treat unvaccinated people. But on the other hand, the monoclonal antibody is authorized for preventing not fully vaccinated people at risk from progressing into the stage. So when there are some physician or physician group that are expressing not willing to treat unvaccinated people, there is an apparent conflict and potential unethical situation developing here. 
And it is really unclear at this point why only so few people are getting Regicove when it is FDA authorized, effective, safe, and free for most patients. And you want to ask alternative approach, right? In fact, practicing doctors have also tried to develop a cocktail type of therapy to provide early treatment for COVID-19. Here I quote an article that was published last year in the American Journal of Medicine around August time. And to provide a treatment rationale here on the right hand side and guideline using off-label FDA approved drug to treat COVID but everything seems to be quite controversial these days. That guideline had drawn some controversial discussion back and forth within the medical community. So the monoclonal antibody major drawbacks is it that is an injection or infusion. So the next question would be what can we expect for an authorized oral medication to treat mild to moderate COVID? In fact, Merck and a Miami-based uh, biopharmaceutical company called Richback Biotherapeutics are now testing an oral antiviral drug called monopiravir. Now, I may be saying it wrong, please forgive me. In a phase 3 trial to measure the drug's efficacy in non-hospitalized people who have at least one risk factor for serious complication from COVID, now in their phase 2 study, they showed very good safety profiles and all of the participants who took the drug had a significant reduction of viral load after 5 days of treatment compared to only about a quarter of the placebo participants had a reduced viral load after 5 days of treatment. And the small good news is that, like the monoclonal antibody, the U.S. government has agreed to purchase approximately 1.7 million courses of the drug upon issuance of emergency use authorization or approval by the FDA, which means it will provide free drugs for about 1.7 million of eligible COVID patients. But the question is, is that enough? When we look closer to what this drug is intended for, there's still a catchy line here. This upcoming drug still have the line saying, have at least one risk factor for serious complication from COVID-19. And when we think about flu, which was used to as a comparison to COVID-19, especially during the early stages of the pandemic, we have Tamiflu, a prescription oral medication used to treat flu in people um, two weeks of age and older who have had uh, flu symptoms for no more than two days. And we know for the fact that flu is a lot less deadly and has way fewer complications than COVID, and yet we still have a drug to treat within two days of the symptom onset. So there's really a strong need to look for treatment for mild to moderate cases. So it doesn't lead to all these complications, even in non-high-risk patients. And yes, I know what you are thinking. I know many viewers will bring up this anti-parasitic drug. Many people have also expressed how well this drug works and I acknowledged your experience. But on the other hand, a major randomized control trial for this drug has been withdrawn due to questionable study designs and result. This might be disappointing for many people. So let's have a conclusion and summary to wrap up this video. We talked about the need to treat mild to moderate COVID is very strong. And at this point, only Regicove is authorized to treat a subset of those patients. However, it is still appeared to be underutilized. Now, as much as we want a drug that can be relabeled, we still need direct evidence for its safety and effectiveness. And let's remember, when we demand strong evidence for vaccine trials to prove its safety and effectiveness, we also need to see the same standard of evidence for a treatment option. 
Well, I understand we are all very desperate to find a effective treatment for early or mild cases of COVID, and I acknowledged and recognized many people are seeking alternative treatment at this point, and I respect that. But the bottom line is that it is still very important for all of us to recognize the disease and protect. Yourself and your loved ones, and that is all for this week. And if you would like to continue following my COVID-related updates and learn more about other topics that I've been、uh, starting to produce here and here, please consider subscribing to my channel. This channel need your help to reach more people. And that is all for this week. And I'll see you in the next video.、Uh, please stay safe and healthy, and don't forget. To like, subscribe, and share. All right. Bye.